Well, okay, put your hand up if you like superheroes. Anyone like superheroes? Oh, man, not very many. I'm, okay, there we are. They're slowly coming up. Okay, very good. Uh, name your favorite superhero. Uh -huh. Or just one that you like. Spider-Man. Spider -Man. Superman. Superman, okay. Now, when you watch a Superman movie or cartoon or something like that, Maybe it's just me, but sometimes do you think to yourself, oh, I wish I could do that? Yeah, that would be so cool if I could like, pick up cars and just throw them, or fly through the sky, or use webs to f swing around a city. You know, that would be pretty cool. And you know, maybe you're tempted to look and think to yourself, man, how do they do that? I wish I could do that. That would be so cool. And it's meant to, like, it's made that way, isn't it? The movies are made that way to make you feel like that. And, and sometimes when we read the Bible, we can read the Bible a little bit like that. We read through the stories of Jesus doing really amazing things and we think to ourselves, oh, I really wish I could do that. That would be cool. You know, if I could just walk up and heal everyone and, and just get rid of evil spirits and walk around doing all the cool stuff Jesus did. However, that's not how we're meant to read the Gospels. The Gospels don't present us with Jesus, tell us stories of Jesus so we can say, oh yeah, I'm going to be just like that. I'm going to do all these cool things too. They're telling us something wonderful about Jesus so that we understand something about God. Because Jesus is the revelation. He shows us what God is like. And in our passage today, we're going to be looking at Jesus doing a whole bunch of amazing miracles and wonderful things. And we're going to be thinking about how it enables us to know God more. But especially, we're going to be thinking about how does Jesus do these things? How does Jesus go around healing people? Because that's the question on many people's minds. Where does this power that Jesus used come from? And the Bible helps us understand that. So let's pray and ask God to help us see Jesus and understand him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you indeed that you have shown us yourself through Jesus. And we pray that you would give us hearts and minds to read and understand and to see Jesus as he truly is presented in the Gospels. We pray for these little children. We thank you for their presence among us. And we ask that, Lord, you would work in their hearts, that they might see and love Jesus all of their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are turning through to the Gospel according to Matthew today. For those who are visitors here today, we've been working our way through the Gospel, going through it at a swift rate, and we are picking up in chapter 14 today. Matthew chapter 14. This evening we'll be looking at chapter 15, finishing up at verse 31. But as I say, for today, we're in Matthew 14. Picking up at verse 1, and this is God's word for you today. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. This is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now, 
When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said, A blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of all the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us, and as we come to consider it, let us come before him in a time of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love and mercy that, Lord, you are a God who has revealed yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have recorded it for us, that we might see him and know him. And we pray today that as we come to consider this wonderful chapter, that we would indeed see him with fresh eyes. And in seeing him with fresh eyes, we would delight in him. We pray, Lord, that each and every one of us would hear the word of Christ echoing in our hearts, that we might leave here feeling nourished and fed. God, grant us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a young teenager, I used to really love those uh, 
those shows about the world's strongest men. You ever seen those competitions where you get these enormous guys that lift like these massive concrete boulders and they get like trucks strapped to them and they drag like three trucks or a plane or something. I remember being a young teenager, she was like, yeah, I wish I could do that. But I remember thinking to myself, man, how, how do they do that? Like, it's just phenomenal, the stuff they lift, the things they throw, the strength they exude. Thing, how, what, where does this power come from? And, and it's really that type of a feeling that we get in this passage. Where does this power come from? Who is this man, Jesus Christ? And how can he do these things? And it's introduced with a statement by, John, by Herod about John, isn't it? And so... When Herod hears of the fame of Jesus, he makes the comment, he comes to the conclusion, where does the power come from? Verse 2, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. And then we get a side story about why it is that John died, because Matthew hasn't told us that yet. But, but the main point of that section is, where does Jesus get his power from? Is it, as Herod concludes, just because he's got borrowed power from someone else, right? He's been, John's raised from the dead. Jesus is John embodied, looks different, but it's just John again. Or is there something else going on here? In the life of Jesus Christ. And then we get three stories that enable us to answer that question. Where does this power come from? And so Herod, having made this statement, having Matthew having told us about the death of John, Jesus goes off to a desolate place. And you can understand why, can't you? Lest we forget that John is effectively Jesus' cousin. It would have been a disturbing reality for Jesus, right? He's just as human as you are. He feels pain and sorrow just as much as you do. And so Jesus, filled with sorrow and, and pain in his heart for the loss of his family member and the forerunner and a mighty prophet, he withdraws to a desolate place. But of course, Jesus doesn't ever get much time by himself, does he? The crowds hear and the crowds follow. And when they come to him, we get that wonderful reminder in verse 14 of the compassion of Jesus. He looks upon the crowd, we've heard this before, and he has compassion on them. Previously, Jesus, we've been told, had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And the same reality is playing out here. The disciples are concerned. And so the disciples say, we should probably send them away because the day's getting late and they need something to eat. And then Jesus brings those wonderful words, you feed them. Not sure how you would have felt if you were the disciples at that point, 5,000 men and then a bunch of wives and children and other people hanging around. I mean, some of you mothers know what it's like when someone turns up with five extra guests out, out of the blue and you're like, I've got to feed them right now. It's like, ah, panic, get everything ready. Jesus says, feed them. But they can't, can they? The disciples can't feed this crowd. They have no power to nor ability to, nor riches to. All they've got is a few loaves of bread and fish. But Jesus, Jesus says, tell them to recline. Tell them to sit down. It's, it's the same word that you use to describe Jesus' reclining at the table for the Lord's Supper. And so here they are reclining for supper on a grass paddock, field, with the presence of Jesus among them. And as they sit there, gathered together in this field, the Lord Jesus himself begins to lay a table before them. I wonder if you're getting any echoes here 
from Psalm 23. What does the shepherd do? He lays a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He'll make me lie down where? In green pastures. And so here we have this group of people harassed and hungry and desolate. And the Lord himself comes along and he feeds them. Because he is the shepherd, the Lord's the Lord's shepherd, our shepherd, providing for his people with miraculous power and abundantly so that they are fully satisfied. No one's hungry. But how does he do it? I mean, if you go to the liberal scholars, they've got to answer for everything. And so what they'll tell you is, the disciples got the five loaves of bread and the fish and they shared. And then everyone else went, wow, sharing's a great idea. And I'm going to share my lunch too. And everyone began sharing their lunch. And so everyone had enough food because, you know, communism's great and we should all share evenly. That was sarcastic, by the way. But that, that's not what's going on here, right? There is only a few loaves of Bread. There is only a few fish. And yet Jesus can use it to provide for everyone. Well, we're actually told where the power comes from. I wonder if you picked up on that. Have a look at the text with me. So, verse 19, he orders the crowds to sit or to recline down on the grass. He takes the five loaves and the two fish, and what does he do? He looks up to heaven and he said a blessing. That, that's not just to inform you of what Jesus did. It's to inform you of how it was that this miraculous power could come about. It's because Jesus looked to heaven and by faith and through the work of the Spirit who fully indwelt Jesus Christ and through the blessing of the Father, so through the work of the triune God, this miraculous work could be done. It's not because he's John the Baptist reincarnated. It's because all of the power of heaven is at work in this Son of Man. And by faith, he looks up to his Father and he trusts him. And we remember those words that we've run into several times. He is the one who is well-pleasing to his Father, right? And so when the Son prays a blessing, the Father blesses it indeed. But it's also interesting that Jesus doesn't ask for a blessing. You know, people will say, as, as a minister, when you go to events, people always ask you to pray for things. So if you go to events, someone says, oh, you're a pastor, you can pray for the food. And what they'll frequently say to me is, oh, Pastor Logan, can you bless the food, please? And do you know what I love to say? No, I can't. And they say, well, what do you mean, No. I said, well, only God can bless the food. I can ask him to bless the food, but I can't bless the food because I've got no more power than you do. But I would be pleased to pray for the food. But do you notice Jesus doesn't ask for the food to be blessed, does he? He says a blessing. Because Jesus himself has the power given to him from heaven to bless the food and cause it to multiply and satisfy everyone. And brothers and sisters, you should find great comfort in that. Because Jesus has not changed, has he? The writer to the Hebrews says that he was he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, that's not talking about today and yesterday. That's meaning in the time of the Gospels, in this present age, and in the age to come. 
He never changes. And so the same Jesus who would provide for this crowd through the miraculous power of God is the same one who cares for you. And that means you can trust him. It means you can look to him to provide your every need. Because if he can feed 5,000 people from a few loaves and a few fish, how much more can he provide for you and care for you? And so we see this miraculous power working out through the shepherd of God's people. But then we see the same miraculous power working out through the Son of God. Jesus sends the disciples away in verse 22. He sends them off. One wonders if it's because like in John, this is the time when the crowds seek to take Jesus by force and make him king. We're not sure. But Jesus sends the disciples away. And then after dismissing the crowds in verse 23, what does he do? He goes up to the mountain by himself to pray. The disciples, meanwhile, are in the boat. Some of them are fishermen, some of them are not. They're tax collectors. Some of them have no idea what they're doing in a boat. But they're making their way across the sea, and it's not going well. Now, some of you may know what this is like. I remember I love kayak fishing, for those of you that haven't worked this out yet. And, and one day I went out on a supermoon, which I thought would be a great idea. Turns out it was a terrible idea. And the swells were large, and the wind was very strong. And after about three hours fishing, I had been driven very far away from my car, and I had to paddle the whole way back with the wind in my face and swell lapping over the top of my kayak the entire way. And it took me about two hours of paddling to get back. By the time I got back, I was so weak, I could not lift my kayak up onto my car. By God's grace, some random dude happened to be walking past who could help me. But you can imagine these disciples in a situation like that, right? They're working and they're working and they're working and they're into the fourth watch of the night, we're told in verse 25. So they've been, they've been hard at it, right? They're slogging their guts out trying to get across. And what's really interesting is the word that's used to describe in verse 24 that they're being beaten by the waves and the wind is against them. It's the word harassed. They're being harassed by the ocean, by the sea. And the sea, in biblical language, is always the presence of evil, right? When you read through the Old Testament, the sea is always the presence of evil. And so here is the picture of the evil forces harassing the disciples of Christ, trying to stop them from going to where Christ has sent them. And yet, they're not alone, right? Because Jesus sees them. Jesus is up on the mountain, and up on the mountain, the Lord Jesus Christ can look out by sight and see the needs of his disciples. And as he looks, and as he sees, he takes action. And he walks out across the water. I've got no idea what that looks like. But what does it even look like for someone to walk on water? I mean, were his feet below the waves? Above the waves? Just hover over the top of them? Who knows? But he walked out upon the water. And as he walks out upon the water, the people see him. The disciples see him and they do the most logical thing, right? None of us is sitting in the boat and goes, well, clearly it's a guy walking on the water. No one comes to that conclusion. Everyone freaks out. It's a ghost. And Jesus says those precious words, take heart. It's I. Take heart. I am. Be not afraid. How does he do it? Well, what was he doing before he walked up on the mount, walked out across the water? He was looking up into heaven, wasn't he? 
He stayed behind and he set his face towards his father in prayer. He didn't wave a magical wand of divinity. Sometimes we treat Jesus like this. Like he just walked, walked around with his power of divinity zapping people. But you've got to remember, he's fully human. Humans can't walk on water. But before he did, he was bowed down before his God, seeking his Father's will, seeking God's help. And God gave it to him. And so by faith, Jesus Christ can walk across the water, trusting himself into his father's care. And this is illustrated beautifully with Peter. Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come out. Tell me to come out to you. Command me to come out. And Jesus says, come. Now, why can Peter walk on the water? Is it because he's all of a sudden gotten divine power? No. But by faith in the word of Christ. Christ has said, come. And so by believing the word of Jesus, Peter can walk upon the water. But when doubts come in, when doubts come in, he is no longer held up. It's not because the word of Christ is not trustworthy, nor because the power of God is not sufficient, but because Peter doubts the word of God as he looks at the wind and the waves. But brothers and sisters, just, does Jesus ever doubt? Perfect faith, right? Perfect trust, faith and trust that would bring him to say, Father, your will be done. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Trust that relies wholeheartedly upon God. And it's this power of God at work in Jesus Christ through faith that enables him to do these things. And you know what's really wonderful about that? Is that we have been given this same faith. You see, Peter's just a, a wonderful little image of it for us, right? That we can rely by faith upon the word of God and take him at his promises, take him at his commands and believe wholeheartedly. And he will do it. Because if the Lord says, come, we may come. And has Jesus Christ not said, come to us? All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are there not many of us here today who desperately need help and comfort in the midst of stormy trials and difficulties? And yet he has said to us, do not be afraid. Has he not said to us, trust in me? Has he not said to us, I am with you, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Has he not said to us, I am sufficient? And so by faith, we can lay hold of him in all of our challenges, in all of our trials, in all of our pain, in all of our difficulties, and we can cast our burdens upon him. And he is there, even in the time of our doubts. To grab us by the hand. When we cry out, Lord, save me. When we, like the Father in a couple of chapters, cry out, Lord, help my unbelief. Jesus Christ is there, the faithful high priest, to help us. 
And what do the disciples do? They fall down and worship him. Why? Truly, you are the Son of God. It's not because he's John the Baptist. It's because, as we confessed earlier in the service, he is truly God and truly man. Two natures in one flesh. He is both the perfect son of man and the perfect son of God. And so as the son of man, Jesus is walking upon the water in his divine nature. He is propping up his own feet that he might walk across the water and do all that his father has commanded him. Step aside, John the Baptist, for we have a better prophet, don't we? We have the Lord Jesus. And so we see the, the shepherd showing his power and, and caring for his sheep. We see the Lord, the Son of God, caring for his disciples. And then lastly, we see Jesus healing the sick. The Messiah healing the sick. Verse 34. They cross over the sea. Verse 35, he's recognized. And then they begin to gather together all who were sick. You can imagine the picture. Beds, carts, hobbling, crutches, people with all levels of infirmities and demon oppression, sickness, brokenness everywhere, hordes and masses. They bring them all to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they implore him in verse 36 that they might only touch the fringe of his garment or the tassels. The Jews had to have tassels on the edges of their garments that we might just touch the tassels on the edge of your garments. And as many as touched it were made well. It's a striking couple of verses, isn't it? Jesus doesn't say a word. The, the picture is almost like Jesus is just, just wandering through the masses. And the masses just stretch out and grab his garment and are immediately healed. So why here? Why now? Well, because it highlights something for us about the power at work in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember those wonderful words that close out the Old Testament in the book of Malachi? The sun of righteousness will rise with what? Healing in its wings. Now the word for wings is a word you also use to describe the edges of your garments. And so the, the wings of Christ are hanging out from him. And the people touch it and are made well. Because he is the son of righteousness. He is the promised Messiah. Or you could think of the Psalms where we're told that God does what? Overshadows his people with his wings, right? And he gathers them like a mother hen under his wings. And like David when he says in the Psalms that I hide myself under your pinions. Your wing feathers. Because you are my refuge. And so here coming to fulfillment is all of these Old Testament prophecies and promises of one who would come. Who in the very edges of his wings and garments would be the bestowal of blessing and healing for the brokenness of humanity. This is our Jesus. He's not weak, he's not powerless, but he is mighty to save. Such is his power that it just exudes from him because he is the Messiah. And blessings follow 
like a bridal train around her. You've seen those really fancy, fancy weddings, you know, with a garment like sticks 50 meters out the back, and this train of people holding it. Looks, very, looks amazing. Wow, so too the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It flows out from him. Because he has come to do good, to bless his people, to bestow upon them all of the grace and mercy and kindness of God. Brothers and sisters, are we not bound up with suffering and pain and sorrow in this world? Do we not get sick? Do we not get cancer? Well, there is one who comes with healing in his wings. Sometimes we have to wait for it. Sometimes we have to wait for glory for it. And yet there is always a day of healing coming. A day when the, the tree with the leaves for the healing of the nations shall be laid hold of by God's people. A day when those garments of praise will be seen with our very eyes. This is no John the Baptist. This is the incarnate Son of God and no other. What Matthew is doing, what Jesus is showing is that he is the all-sufficient Savior for the nations. Jew, Gentile, Kiwi, Australian, American, Asian, European. It makes no difference. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation can come to the Lord Jesus Christ and find healing in his wings. Where does he get this power from, brothers and sisters? He gets it from God, right? And isn't it wonderful that he does? Because what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is... He is what all the other world religions say of him. He's a wonderful teacher, a powerful rabbi, a good example, an incarnation among many, in which case he cannot save you from your sin. He cannot help you in your sorrow. He cannot do anything to help you. But since he is the son of God, the son of man, the shepherd, the Messiah, he can do everything that God has promised. That's why we can say, now unto him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ever ask or think because Jesus Christ is the son of God and son of man and brothers and sisters don't be tempted to say to yourself well that's fine pastor Logan that's fine for when he was on earth he's not walking around here anymore My dear listener, if you're thinking that today, have you forgotten that Jesus said it is better that I go away? It is better that I go away? Why? Because then my Father will send the Helper, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ who wields the power of Christ for the sake of God's people. 
I mean, I would love to look upon Jesus with my human eyes right now. But if Jesus never left, he would be in Jerusalem and I would be here. And so would you. But now we have Jesus present among us and in our hearts, wielding the power of God for our good. And that is something to be encouraged about, isn't it? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the spirit of Christ present in our midst. And that this same power that we see at work in Jesus Christ while he lived out his days in his flesh upon this earth is present among us today. And so we pray, Lord, help us to cast ourselves upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.